All right, guys, so we have chapter 12 here, which will be on rotational dynamics. So we covered rotational kinematics along with the linear kinematics back in chapter four. So I recommend you guys go back and look at chapter four. Um, I think the last uh, few sections, we talk about rotational kinematics, angular velocity, angular displacement, and things like that. So I'll give you a little overview of here, but we I covered it in greater detail in, a, uh, in chapter four. All right, so in this chapter then, what we have here is more or less you can think of like rotational dynamics. So we need to understand the physics of rotating objects. And to do that, we need to um, introduce a new type of, uh, let's say a model. Particle model that we used before doesn't apply here anymore because the object that we're working with now have size, which means that we call them a rigid body. So rigid body, you can, can see right here is an extended object whose size and shape do not change as it moves. That means we are talking about an object that now has a very distinct size and shape. And we have, it says it has a radius, right? If it's like a circular object and thing like that. So, and um, this rigid body model is, you know, in a way replaces the particle model because when you talk about rotation, uh, when particles are rotating, technically, you know, you can't really tell if it's rotating or not if it doesn't have a size, right? It has to have a size, it has to rotate with respect to some kind of axis, maybe it's center. So then you can, you know, consider a rotation. And we simplified before and we said that particle doesn't have a size and we could ignore completely the rotational effect. Uh, so here we have to take that into account if we are, you know, you want to study the rotational uh, motion. So that means our object right now going to be a rigid body, right? Rigid object or rigid body object, which means that we assume that it has a size, shape, and it doesn't change as the system is rotating. So we have, in a way now, um, covered translational motion, which is same as linear motion, where object moving linearly without rotation. Now we can also look at it in terms of rotational motion where an object can basically rotate with respect to some axis, maybe like let's say at this point with respect to its center. So it's rotating without moving, you know, linearly. Or we can have a combination. So that means the object is rotating and moving linearly. And that's, you know, you can, you can say it's a kind of like a combination motion. We can talk about that, for example, when we get to a rolling motion, because if you have a disc, and this is moving and ro rotating, that's known as a rolling motion. And uh, obviously, you know, we have to cover the rolling motion if we're considering rotation of the object that has both translational and rotational motion. So these are some of the few uh, review slides. If you remember, we talked about before um, that if you have a disc, for example, and this is rotating with respect to some axle, right? Some axis of rotation then we can make the measurement of uh, some point, right? So of some point, let's say it goes as a function of time, the point moves uh, with the disc and when it changes its position, we can make that position, you know, in terms of linear arc length, you know, in meters, basically measurement, or we can also make a measurement in radians in terms of the angle theta. So, or theta in radians, right? So which is angular displacement. So that means, remember, we have then this theta, which was equal to then arc length divided by r. And this equation can be representing, like I said, now changing position, with, but in terms of the arc, you know, not arc length, but angular displacement. And it was more useful because if you remember, I showed you this example when you have two particles moving from point one to point two, and their arc length is different even though they're moving with this on the same disc with, you know, at the same time, but their angular displacement is the same and their angular velocity is the same and their angular acceleration is the same while none of their linear variables are the same. So that's why we have then the angular displacement replacing in a way the linear displacement if the body is just rotating and change at the, or the rate at which you change the angular position is known as angular velocity given with omega and then if the omega it changes with time, that means that this starts spinning faster or slower, then we have alpha. And this alpha here is basically angular acceleration in the radians per second square, okay?
All right. So, and then we developed the kinematic equations where we have basically same kinematic format as the linear kinematic equations, uh, but this is in terms of the angular you know, variables. So remember, this is basically kinematic equation one, where final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. It's just in terms of the angular variables. Here's kinematic equation two, you know, for the uh, final displacement. And this is kinematic equation three, which is again, same format as the final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times alpha times delta theta. So that means this is basically same format as the linear kinematic equations, but in a way, those three equations are enough to describe rotational kinematics. That means whenever the disc is rotating and you wanna find how long did it take for it to go, let's say several revolutions or what is the final rotational speed at some later time and things like that, those three equations together can you know, help you solve those. Uh, one thing we have for those um, three equations requirements that alpha has to be constant. Constant means that you know, the angular acceleration doesn't change as a function of time. And also when we have a system that is rotating, remember then counterclockwise, oh, sorry, counterclockwise is happened to be like our positive direction, clockwise then is defined to be our negative direction. So in a way then think like this, if this is representing initial velocity, angular velocity, and that means it's positive since it's you know, counterclockwise, and you have a positive angular acceleration, which means that, you know, you are, you are moving to the, you know, in counterclockwise, and then you have a rate at which you change your ax, you know, speed at the counterclockwise direction. That means you're gonna be speeding up. At later time, your angular velocity will increase. Kind of similar when you have a more, you know, velocity to the right and acceleration to the right, so you speed up to the right. But if you have a, you know, angular velocity to the right, uh, counterclockwise, but the negative uh, angular acceleration, which means, you know, it is clockwise technically, then obviously you slow down because the, the signs don't match. Remember, when the sign of angular velocity and angular acceleration are the same, system speeds up, including here. So if you rotating clockwise and both angular acceleration, and angular velocity are clockwise, right? Both negative, you still speed up. Only when they're in opposite, then you slow down. All right, so I have a couple of examples where you can, can see how all those uh, equation can be applied to uh, a problem like this for the rotational system. So you have an angular position theta of a 0.36 meter diameter flywheel is given by, that means it, it's a uh, theta as a function of time, how it changes. It's two radians per second cube, T cube. All right, so then we wanna find the theta in radians and in degrees at some two, two time, right? T1 is equals to two seconds, T2 equals five seconds. So the two different times. And then what we're gonna do here is taking that displacement equation, right? So again, so this is basically theta as a function of time. So it's equals to two, technically T cube. All right, so if you kind of, you know, ignore the units for the sake of, you know, making it, you know, compact. So think like this, then uh, theta. All right, so theta when T is equals to two seconds, this is basically two times, well, two seconds cubed, okay? So then I can write this in terms of, remember this is in, in, in radians, right? That's why it's radians per second cubed. So it ends up being 16 radians. And I can convert this into where two, you know, or the better conversion is basically pi radians is uh, 180 degrees, right? So radians cancel out and I can calculate this as 920 degrees. Theta at five seconds, then is two times five seconds cubed. Then I get 250 radians. Again, converting where the pi radians is 180 degrees, we, you know, we get 14,000 degrees. Okay, so that's basically the theta as a function of time for those two specific, you know, uh, times, two, two seconds and five seconds. Part B, it says, find the distance that the particle on the flywheel rim moves from, you know, t equals one, uh, two seconds or two, two equals uh, five seconds. It means for the, in a way, three second time interval. Well, all we have to do is just find delta theta, which is theta, you know, two minus theta one, taking this to be theta two, this is taking theta one. So then this is um, 
250 radians minus 16 radians, and we get 234 radians. Okay. And part C it says find then the average angular velocity in radians per second and in revolution per second over that time interval. Well, average angular velocity, put like this, it's change in theta over time. And then the delta theta was already 234 radians. Then divided by time interval, which is, you know, you know uh, T2 minus T1, so it's three seconds. So then we can get 78 radians per second. Now we want in terms of the revolution per minute. So we convert this where then uh, two pi radians is one revolution, because right, when you do one complete revolution is equal to two pi radians. And then 60 seconds is one minute. So then we can convert it to revolution per minute. So this becomes basically 740 revolution per minute, or we can write it as 740 RPM. That's a revolution per minute. Part D it says find then the instantaneous angular velocities at T1 equals two seconds and T2 equals five seconds. Anything instantaneous then requires us to have a velocity equation, angular velocity equation, obviously. That means I have to take the derivative of theta with respect to time. Taking the derivative of the two T, T cubed basically is six T squared, right? Should be able to get this with no problem. Then I have the omega when T is equals to two seconds. So this is then six times two seconds square, right? So then this should give me, you know, two square is four, six times four, 24 radians per second. Then also omega at t equals five seconds. So six times five seconds square, which is basically 25 times six, and that's 150 radians per second. And those are basically the answers for us. All right, so another example. So you have finished watching a movie on a Blu-ray and the disc is slowing to a stop. The disc's angular velocity at t equals zero is 27.5 radians per second. And its angular acceleration is a constant 10 radians per second squared. Uh, negative 10, so negative should be over there. Okay, so a line PQ, so this line over there uh, on the disc surface lies along the positive X axis at t equals zero. And then what we can do, we can look at how that line is basically moving as a function of time. So the question is, what is the disk's angular velocity at t equals 0.3 seconds? Uh, well, this is again, kinematic equation. That means we can write down as uh, what's given to us and what we need to find. We're given that at t equals zero, our angular velocity was 27.5. That means omega initial is 27.5 radians per second. We're given that angular acceleration is negative 10 radians per second square. And technically the theta initial was zero. So what we need to find is omega final when t is equals to 0.3 seconds, right? And then at the, you know, for part B is then basically theta final pretty much. All right, so for part A is simple enough because it's asking for the omega final 0.3 seconds, assuming that we are given omega initial and alpha. This is nothing but the angular velocity, uh, sorry, kinematic one. So omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. Then this is equals to 27.5 plus negative 10 times 0.3 seconds. All right, so calculate this and we can find basically angular velocity, right? At that time, which then will give us 24.5 radians per second. It makes sense because we are pretty much slowing down. All right, so for part B then, uh, now that we have our final angular velocity at that time, we wanna, we wanna learn what angle does the line PQ makes with the positive X axis at the time. All right, so then uh, what we can do here is we can find theta final. And there are at least, you know, several equations, several ways we can find that. We can use equation two or we can use equation three. And the easiest one is using equation two at this point. So theta final equals theta initial plus omega initial times time plus one half alpha T squared. That means theta final is equals to zero plus 27.5 radians per second times then a 0.3 seconds, then minus one half 10, or you can say this plus, this is minus, right? 
radians per second squared times 0.3 seconds squared and calculate the angular displacement to be 7.8 radians. All right, so one thing we can also do here is even make this convert it to the revolution. So it, it's a little bit easier for us to read when then two pi radians is one revolution. Canceling that, we can get 1.25 revolution, which means it's like one and a quarter of a revolution during that 0.3 second of time. All right, so this was more or less the review of chapter four concepts. So next, we're gonna start learning new stuff, which is now that we have a rigid object and this rigid object can be rotating, then we can also look at in terms of rotation with respect to what we call center of mass. Okay, so you can see, right? Unconstrained object on which there is no net force rotates about a point called the center of mass. The center of mass remains motionless while every other point in the object undergoes circular motion around it. That means if I'm considering every point around it like this, they all rotate, right? Relative to this, you know, center of mass. Center of mass is actually at the rest. So that's the only point that is not rotating when the entire thing is rotating. So one of the important things will be then to be able to calculate that center of mass. And to calculate that center of mass, we can use in terms of, um, let's say Cartesian coordinates, take the object in a, you know, at some kind of uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? And we can put it any way we want. We can, in a way we can just move it uh, exactly where the center of mass at the origin or something like that. But, you know, let's say it doesn't really matter as long as you have some kind of, you know, um, reference position. And let's say if I'm looking for this position over here, and one thing I can do here is I can find the center of mass. Now, the finding the center of mass of, of an object like this, it's a little more complicated. But for example, if you have a system of particles, so let's say here you have, you know, particle one, particle two, particle three, let's say particle four, and then you want to find the center of mass of this system of particles, then it's a little bit easier because this, for example, this could be your M1, this could be your M2, this could be your M3, this could be your M4. And then you get the position of each one, right? Let's say X4 comma Y4. This will be, let's say then X1 comma Y1 and so on and so forth. And then what we can do here is to find the center of mass of this system. Then we use these equations. So you can see, right? You take mass one times its horizontal position plus mass two times its horizontal position so that means it's, you know, M1 times X1, then plus M2 times X2, plus M3 times X3, plus, you know, M4 times X4. For example, for this particular, you know, configuration that I drew, uh, M1 doesn't have X1, M2 doesn't have X1, so those are zero. But for example, M3 and, you know, M4, they do have it. But then we do the, we take the sum and then we divide by the total mass, which is M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4. And that's how we can calculate X center of mass. Then same thing we can do for the Y center of mass. And Y center of mass, basically then adding the product of mass and, you know, let's say center of mass. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you an example like that, you can see. So generally, if you have a system of particle like this, it's a little bit easier. For, for this type of shape, it's a little bit more complicated and requires actually uh, integral rather than, you know, this little bit simpler equation for the uh, positions. All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples like this for sort of like a system of particles. So let's say there are three people of roughly equal mass M on a lightweight air-filled banana boat sit along the x-axis at position. So person A is at one meter from the origin person B is the five meters and person C is, um, let's say six meters. So we wanna then find this, you know, position of the center of mass and ignore the boat's mass because it's a, you know, lightweight air field so we can ignore it. All right, so then what I can say here is this, in terms of then X center of mass is equals to, well, here's what I have. We're not given the mass of each object but we were told that the roughly equal mass of M. Okay, so let's do this then. So I'm gonna say X1, M, instead of like saying M1, because I can say then M1 is equals to M2 is equals to some M. So X1 times M plus X2 times M plus X3 times M 
over the total mass, which is then 3M. Then you can see, right? I can technically then cancel all the M's like this. So then from here, I get then X1 plus X2 plus X3 divided by three. I cancel the M, but three stays, remains there, right? So then this is equals to, so then one meter plus five meters plus six meters over, over three. And this is what? So uh, it's 10 over three, right? So then it's roughly, you know, um, Okay, never mind. It's not 10 over 3, it's 12 over 3. My math is bad. So 1 plus 5 is 6, 6 plus 6 is 12, so 12 over 3. This is in meters, right? So then we get 4 meters. That means if you come back right here, this is the center of mass of this system. Okay, 4 meters is the center of mass. And because there is no vertical, you know, particles, right? So that's basically the only thing we need in terms of X center of mass. Now we have three particles each of mass 2.5 kilogram are located at the corners of a right triangle whose sides are two meters and 1.5 meter long uh, as shown. And we wanna locate basically the center of mass. So for that, again, so we have um, particle, right? So again, so I can say that um, X center of mass equals M1 times X1 plus M2 times X2 plus M3 times X3. And this is divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3, okay. So in a way, um, I can do two things. I can keep the older M's there or I can technically cancel, right? Each have the same mass. So I can do sort of like, let's say similar thing what I did before and just basically cancel all the mass, okay. So either way is fine. So let's say here I can do, again, so basically X1 plus X2 plus X3 divided by, you know, three, assuming that I cancel the mass. So also I can see that particle uh, one or A, right? In this case, I guess, so it doesn't have an X position. So this is then zero, okay. So then this is equals to X2, which is two meters plus X3, which is also two meters, then divided by three, okay. So then this is basically four over three and we get 1.33 meters. That's X center of mass. And I can do same thing for Y center of mass, which is M1 Y1 plus M2 Y2, <coughs> excuse me, M3 Y3 and divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. Again, I can cancel the mass, right? Because they're all identical. So this will be then Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 over three. Then I can see that particle one doesn't have a Y position, particle two doesn't have a Y position. So it ends up being Y3 over three. And Y3 is 1.5 meters over three, then we get 0.5 meters. That means those are my positions. So then I can say R center of mass, right? Is equals to X center of mass, comma Y center of mass, or it's 0.5, Oops, 1.33 meters comma 0 0.5 meters. That means there then this is the center of mass. All right, so if the object, right? If the object is a sort of like an extended object, it's not a system of particles and you wanna find center of mass, then you have to actually do the integral. So you have to integrate that in order to find center of mass. All right, so for example, here I have an extended object. And what I will do, I will then divide the extended object into many small cells of this mass delta M. And then I take one of them as a, you know, a sample that I'm going to be using, and then set up my equation, where x center of mass is equals to, so basically, I'm, I'm doing in terms of then like this, right? So it's X center of mass equals then sum of the X sub I delta M over total mass. That means I'm saying that I'm doing the product of this, which is its position times its mass, 
x item delta m plus the second one plus the third one plus the fourth one and i'm going to be adding them all together which basically right uh if you then take the limit right um where delta m approaches infinity so you end up basically having an integral so then this will be the integral for the x center of mass which is you know one over m can be factored out so it's like one over m then you know the sum of x sub i delta m right so then becomes x dm so the delta m becomes basically dm and this is basically the integral for the x center of mass same way then we can do y center of mass okay so this type of calculation is a little bit more let's say complicated and it requires a little more let's say a structure so where we can have to uh, look at in terms of the system how we can set it up in terms of being able to, let's say, integrate of dm, right? Which actually we don't, we actually have to uh, do a substitution. And I'm gonna show you like this in terms of one example. All right, so let's say um, we have a uniform rod. So let's say we have a uniform rod like this. And I wanna find the center of mass. Okay. So what I can do here is I can then, um, Take this rod and put it in a coordinate system where my coordinate system basically goes like this. And I can assume that, you know, so sort of like let's say the thickness is not important, right? So this is my x axis, this is my y axis. And what I do here is again, because it's an extended object, it's not a system of particles, I have to choose a small, you know, element like this, a small element. And then the element has a mass of dm so and the size of dx is this size let's say then the entire rod has a length of l and m is the entire mass of this rod okay so we have that now one of the things we can do here is this right so um if i'm looking at then just this tiny element right so this element dm I can also say that this guy has a distance x right from the from the origin. Okay. My rod is length l, where one end is at the origin, the other one is basically distance l, right? But you know, this element here is just some distance x from it. Now we're gonna take this rod to be uniform, which means the mass is uniformly distributed. Okay, and the mass is uniformly distributed, which means then one of the things we can do here is if I technically then take the mass of the entire rod and divide it by its length, then this is more or less, we, what we do, we define this to be this lambda and this lambda is known as a linear mass density. So it's linear mass density. Okay, it has a unit of kilogram per meters, right? All right, so kilogram per meter, so linear mass density. That means this ratio, right, m over l, mass per length, is known as lambda. Now, one of the things we do here is then this lambda, which is mass, total mass over total length, also equals to then the, the ratio of the mass over length of this small element. That means this is also equals to that. That means lambda is equals to basically dm over dx, okay? Which means then I can take the equation, remember x center of mass, which was in terms of the integral, right? One over m, then integral of x dm, in order for me to find the x center of mass. See, I don't wanna do the integral in terms of dm because let's say I'm gonna, you know, I wanna evaluate entire, through entire, through the distance, right? Through the length of this rod. So then I can take this and I can replace or rearrange where then I can say that dm is equals to, right? dm is equals to lambda dx. I can technically be, you know, do, do, do that in terms of this. Okay. I remember lambda dx or lambda is also equals to this, right? m over l. So we're gonna come back to that because that's important. That means I can come back here and I can say it's one over m total mass then the integral and then replace dm with lambda dx. So it becomes x lambda dx. 
And you can say, right, then I'm replacing dm in, with a dx. And it's easy to do dx integral because I'm gonna integrate this from zero to L. So it's a length, you know, the integration over the entire length of the rod. Then this is equals to one over M, then integral, I can remove the lambda from that. So going from zero or L, and this becomes just nothing but just x dx, just x dx. And then from here, I can say, all right, so then this is equals to lambda over m. What is integral of x dx? Well, it's x squared over two, right? With the limits of from zero to L. That means what I get here is I get lambda over m, L squared over two. All right, so this doesn't look like a you know, center of mass, you know, that we can you know, uh, consider. But here's the thing. I have lambda, which is basically the linear mass density that I don't want it to be there. And I'm gonna replace it with this, m over L. And if I do that, see like m over L over m, right? It was already m over there. Then times L squared over two, then what I'm gonna end up with this. This I'm gonna cancel with that m, this L gonna cancel with that. And here's what I get x center of mass equals then one half times L, which means that if you have a uniform rod, its center of mass is exactly at its center, which should make sense, right? Its center of mass exactly at its half length. And that's how we can find it from here, which, you know, it's intuitive, right? That the center of mass of the uniform rod is at the center, but mathematically, we have to go through this step in order to get that. All right, so another thing we have about the rotating object here is this. Uh, as the system is rotating, then I can look at you know, a few sample particles and I can say, all right, those particles are moving relative to the axis of rotation, right, that axle. And if they're moving with some velocity or with some speed, that means they have kinetic energy. Then one thing we can do here, we can then look at in terms of this kinetic energy of the of the you know individual particles. And if I then add them all together, then I can get the total kinetic energy of this rotating system. So we're gonna develop an equation for the rotational kinetic energy, which is let's say here's particle one, and remember kinetic energy equation, right? It's one half times mass times speed square. So then this is for the particle one. It's kinetic energy of particle one plus kinetic energy of particle two, plus and dot, 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 right? But here's the thing. I'm gonna remember that, uh, I'm gonna recall that angular velocity is more convenient to use for the rotating system than linear velocity that I have over here. So then I'm gonna go and replace linear velocity with r times omega, because v is equals to r times omega. So then if I'm replacing this V with R times omega, then I get that. One half M1, then for v, V1, I get R1 times omega, so it becomes R1 square omega square. This one becomes one half M2 R2 square omega square. And I can see that every term has one half, I can factor out. And also omega one is same as omega two, same as you know everything, so it's constant. Why? Because angular velocity for every particle in the rotating system is the same. So I can factor that one out as well. And that's the key, right? If I leave it in terms of linear velocity, I can't because V1 is not equals to V2, but omega one is equals to omega two, okay? All right, so let's see what I have in the parentheses. It's sum of the mass of each particle times its position square. And that what I have in the parentheses right now is a very important term. Because if I'm comparing this to this equation, which is one half mv square, remember this m, sorry, this m, what it represents here is those that inertial mass, right? Basically, you know, the kinetic energy of the particle, the m generally, you know, or the, the when the object is speeding up or slowing down, that M represents inertial mass, its ability to resist being, you know, change its motion, right? And in this equation, if I'm comparing, that is equivalent to this guy over here, which means one half, sorry, the M, you know, for the linear system is similar to this term over here, which is mass times position square. And that, sorry, that term 
is actually known as moment of inertia, okay? It is known as a moment of inertia and that is important in a way, let me see. So that term is very important because it is known as the moment of inertia of the rotating system, which means this, this, this quantity, right? Sorry, this quantity here, sum of m i sub m sub i r sub i square. It is basically same as taking particle one times its position square plus particle two times its position square times particle three times its position square. And then we use this i, right? Capital I to represent moment of inertia. So, so then rotational system, since, since it was, remember, one half, then sum of m sub i r sub i squared then times omega square. So this term is the moment of inertia. So then we can rewrite the ro rotational kinetic energy as one half i omega square. And i is basically the moment of inertia. So you can see, right, the moment of inertia unit are, you know, m r squared technically. So it's kilograms meter square, right? And moment of inertia depends on the axis of rotation. Because if I have an object rotating with this center, you know, let's say center of mass, its moment of inertia is different if it's rotating with a different axis or different axis, different axis. So moment of inertia is something that depends on the axis of rotation. And we're gonna see that in a, uh, several examples. All right, so now, uh, moment of inertia, again, it's a object's ability to resist being rotated. And it is a little more complicated, more, you know, let's say uh, more uh, involved compared to the linear mass, because not only moment of inertia depends on the axis of rotation and it can be different. That means our ability to rotate like a meter stick, right? Depends on which respect to which axis we're rotating. Are we rotating with respect to center or are we rotating with respect to one end or the other end or somewhere off center, right? We're gonna get a different ability to rotate because of that. Also, not only the mass, but also how far away the mass is with respect to axis of rotation determines what the value of the moment of inertia is. You can see, right? Mass that is further from the rotational axis contributes more to the moment of inertia than mass near this, the axis. It is not a new form of energy, merely the familiar kinetic energy of motion written in a new way, okay? That means this moment of inertia, right? So the moment of inertia is basically um, depends on the axis of rotation, depends on how the mass is distributed in the object. So further the mass distribution, greater the moment of inertia. So for example, if you have two objects, like let's say a shell like this, right? Or, you know, a wheel like that and a solid disc. And let's say the M1 and M2 and both of them have the same mass, it's just, you know, different configuration. Well, the question is which one will be then harder to rotate with respect to center or it will be M1. Why? Because all the mass is concentrated further from the center of axis, where here the mass can, you know, concentrate kind of uniformly, some closer, some further away. So the moment of inertia for one is much greater than moment of inertia for the second one. So it's harder to rotate this than let's say the disc. All right, so uh, for the moment of inertia calculation, if you then considering the entire object rather than just a few particle, then again, you end up generalizing where delta M approaches to zero, this becomes an integral. So uh, it's integral of R squared dm. And not to confuse with the X center of mass, which is integral of R dm. So then the moment of inertia, then integral of R squared dm. So kind of very similar, you know, type of calculation. We can still do the same type of substitution for the linear mass density and thing like that. You just, you know, you have an R square rather than R. So like, let's say, but other than that, pretty much same type of calculation. All right, so uh, where R is the distance from the rotational axis and the procedure much like calculating the center of mass, as I mentioned, right? One rarely needs to do this integral because moment of inertia of common shapes are tabulated. That means I'm, I'm gonna give you a table where I give you the moment of inertia of, of a rod, of a, you know, a disc or a sphere or thing like that. And only when I you know, ask you to actually calculate that or derive that, then you need to actually use this integral. All right, so let's look at an example here. And obviously this is example not a, of a, a, you know, by looking at it right, not of a, a extended object, but the system of particles again. 
So you have four particles, one at each of the four corners of a square with two meter long edges are connected by a massless rod. Okay, that's also important because if the rod has no mass, it doesn't contribute to the moment of inertia. The masses of the particles are M1 and M M1 equals M3 equals three kilograms and M2 and M4 equal to one another and they're four kilograms. So to find the moment of inertia of the system about the Z axis, okay? So then basically this is the Z axis here, right? And then about the axis that passes through the center of the mass and is parallel with the Z axis. All right, so let's look at then what we have. So it's a system of particles. That means I can just do individual calculation for each one and then add them all together. That means moment of inertia is equal to moment of inertia of one plus two plus three plus four, okay? And this basically equals to M1 R1 square plus M2 R2 square plus M3 R3 square. And then mix those R3 square plus M4 R4 square. Okay, so then let's calculate this. So, and remember also in terms of then the values, right? So it's mass. So M1 is three kilograms times then its position. So that means this distance of M1 and M1 doesn't have a size. So that means, or, or things like this, it's radius is unimportant. So this is then the distance, which is basically given as uh, pretty much two meters for us. So even we can say like in terms of even if we take about center to center, that's basically two meters, two meters square. Then plus, um, Ma that was mass one, right? So then mass two. So mass two is uh, four kilograms and then times this distance from this axis of rotation, which is this point. Well, it is at that point. So it has no axis, of, you know, distance from axis of rotation. Then M3. So then which is uh, two kilo, uh, three kilograms. Then its distance here is two meters. Then plus uh, four kilograms for the M4. And then the distance here is this which is, you know, if this is two meters, this is two meters, then this distance R4 is equal to square root of, right? Uh, four plus four. So which end up being two square root of two. So then it's two square root of two squared, like that. All right. So then if I calculate, I'm gonna get 56 kilograms meter square, okay? So that's basically the, the moment of inertia of the system relative to the Z axis. Okay. The next one is in terms of finding it with respect to the center of mass. All right, so then here's the thing. I don't know the, it with respect to the center of mass. I don't know where the center of mass is, okay? So, um, So uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use this, what we call parallel axis theorem. Actually, I have a slide on that. So we're, we're gonna talk about that. So this is a little bit jumping ahead, but you know, think like this. So the idea here for the parallel axis theorem is if you know the I center of mass and you wanna find the moment of inertia with respect to some off center of mass position, then you can use, let's say that, let's say I center of mass plus, for example, thing like this. So let's say here's an object and let's say here's a center of mass and let's say we are given the I center of mass. So then if I wanna know the, let's say axis of rotation or let's say moment of inertia with respect to, I don't know, maybe this point over here instead of center of mass, all I need to know here is I center of mass, how far away that new axis of rotation is. So let's say, let's call this H, then is equals to mass of the object times this h square. And I can find the i prime, let's say, which is the new cent, you know, the axis of rotation. So that, you know, the moment of inertia with respect to this new axis of rotation. So this is the equation we're using. But for this, our, you know, thing like this. So this is our system. And that particular i prime is happened to be just this iz, which we just calculated. So then technically then this is equal to then iz, which we have, equals I center of mass plus MH square. Then I can use this, I can say then I center of mass equals moment of inertia with respect to Z axis, then minus 
mh square. I already have this guy over here. All I need to know here is find that h so then I can get, you know, the moment, uh, moment of inertia with respect to center of mass. Okay. So, and that's kind of what we have to, what we have to do. So like, let's say. So using the symmetry, we can see that X center of mass equals one meters and Y center of mass equals one meters. And the symmetry then tells us, okay, here's the center of mass. And then what I can do since this is my, you know, that I Z, right? So that means this is the distance that I need, right? Remember H here is the distance from the center of mass of this, you know, the different, you know, axis of rotation where I, I prime is right now for us I Z. That means all I need to do here is get the, you know, H uh, and, uh, you know, H square. Then if I'm looking at this, right? So basically this H, right? And this is basically, you know, ends up being just, you know, uh, one meter minus zero square plus one meter minus zero square. So doing like in terms of using the, the geometry to find the H square, which is basically nothing but, you know, our R square, R two square. And this is then basically two meters square. Then I can go and use this equation. I center of mass is equals to, you know, um, 56, which is, you know, the IC, right? So 56 kilograms meter square minus then 14 kilograms times two meter square and calculate this to be 28 kilograms meter square. And that will be then moment of inertia with respect to center of, you know, uh, center of mass. Okay. All right, so as I promised, you know, most of those, um, let's say shapes, you know, most commonly used shapes like rod, uh, plane, a disc, uh, hoop, uh, you know, let's say sphere, you know, solid sphere or shell, they're all given in this table. That means, you know, for example, if you're taking um, a rod uh, and finding the moment of inertia of the rod, it is 112 ml square. If you are rotating it with respect to the center. If you're rotating it with respect to the, you know, one of the ends, moment of inertia is one third ml square. Now the question is that which one is larger? Well, Remember, moment of inertia larger means that it's harder to rotate. Obviously, you know, this is larger because one third compared to one twelfth. That means it's harder to rotate with respect to one of the ends rather than with respect to the center. Another thing very important is the disc, which is one half MR square. So the disc is the one that's going to be used mostly whenever you have a pulley. Whenever you have a disc or a pulley, right, then moment of inertia is one half MR square. And whenever you have a, like, let's say some ball sliding or uh, going down an incline or something like that, then you have a solid sphere, moment of inertia is two fifth MR square. And then we can use that in terms of a moment of inertia, assuming that it's rotating with respect to center. All right. So again, as I mentioned, the moment of inertia uh, depends on the axis of rotation and how the mass is, you know, distributed. So for example, again, those two systems, right? You have mass concentrated at the center compared to mass concentrated around the rim. They have equal mass. So this guy has a smaller moment of inertia and easier to spin. This one has a larger moment of inertia and harder to spin. Why? Because remember, moment of inertia more or less is mass times position square. So more mass is further away from the axis of rotation you know, greater the moment of inertia, harder for us to rotate. Okay. So then I'm going to show you here an example of um, moment of inertia of a thin uniform rod of length L and mass M about an axis perpendicular to the rod through one end. Remember, right? So if I go here, this is one third ML square. And then here I'm going to show you, let's say, how are we getting basically that volume? Why is it one third ML square? And again, this is a very similar calculation like the center of mass. Remember, moment of inertia here is integral, you know, r squared dm, which, you know, I can replace it in terms of x squared dx as dm. 
because it's along the x-axis. And then what I can do here is again, use the same thing where M over L is equals to the linear mass density, or then this is equal to then dm over dx, because I'm using this small dx you know, element, right? Which has a mass dm and the size dx. Again, in a way you can say that m over l is equals to dm over dx. So a lot of times you can just basically right away say dm is equals to, you know, m over l dx and just, you know, ignore the lambda and then just use this, right? So I can say that this is nothing but uh, um, x square, then m over l dx, where I'm replacing dm with that. So we can pretty much do it from here right away. Uh, you want, you can just use the lambda and then do the substitution, you know, it, it either way is fine. So then m over l can come out of the integral. Then all you have here is then just basically x squared dx and you are integrating from zero to L. And this is then M over L, X cube over three, right? X cube over three going from zero to L, or we have M over L, then L cube over three, right? So then you can see that this L cancels with that. You have two, then moment of inertia is nothing but one third M L square. And that's how we get this moment of inertia of a rod, uniform rod, um, basically where the, it is rotating with one of the ends. If it's rotating with, you know, at the center, then what you do here is you take then coordinate system like this. And the only thing changes here, the integral goes from the, from negative L over two to positive L over two. That means, you know, this is negative L over two, this is positive L over two. So you integrate in terms of that, right? But you know, you're still gonna get the same thing. I mean, you're still gonna get now the answer that we have, which is 112 ml square for the, you know, with rotating with respect to the center. All right, so then um, this is exactly what I kind of used before in the example, which is the parallel axis theorem. So you can say, right, you do sometimes need to know the moment of inertia, but an axis in an unusual position. So let's say, Here's an object rotating with respect to axis of rotation through the center of mass. But you wanna know how about some off-center rotational axis? Well, then we use this, uh, you know, parallel, parallel axis theorem where the moment of inertia of some off-center rotation is equals to moment of inertia with respect to center of mass plus total mass times this d squared and the d squared is the position of the new axis from the axis over or the distance of that. So it's relatively straightforward, you know, way of finding the, let's say uh, the moment of inertia of some off-center position. 